for the star where to sign up. <laughs> it's good. It's a good day. Though. Yeah. All righty. Hey, folks who are joining in, um, people are grabbing some pizza in person, and we're gonna get started. And I'm gonna share my screen. And. There we go. All right. Um, can you tell us once more if volume is okay online? Is it working okay? And we might have to check the chat over here and see. Okay. So, uh, welcome everybody to the third session of Green New Deal class. This is uh, we're going to talk about policy today, and we have a really good guest named Sam Diaz, who is also a very generous person and brought everybody pizza. So people are chowing down. Um, I think the, the way the class will go today, it'll be like, I'll talk for like probably 40 or 45 minutes, um, and then we'll take a break, and then I'll pass it off to Sam. And Sam's going to talk about the land use system. I'm mostly going to talk about frameworks around policy and do some like introductory concepts um and then we'll yeah we'll dive into to land you stuff uh as far as like hi as far as um like feedback goes uh i hope we've solved some of the questions around the sound so it's easy to hear questions the audience and stuff and then just be you know type your questions in the chat and meg will try to enter those in there we'll try to be really disciplined about like checking into the chat when we're there was one thing that looks like the issue was making people talk at the same time. So I'm going to need this computer until someone in here has a question or a comment. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, we're going to talk about policy eventually and start, you know, getting into formal questions of what that means and how um, it guides our lives and, and what it means for us in Portland. But the first thing to talk about, which is, ever present in any discussion around policy or law is power. Um, so yeah, what is that? What's power? Why do you suppose that might be important to think about when we're talking about questions of, of policy? Anybody feel free to jump in. Yeah. Like not only who gets to implement decisions, but who influences them um, and who has like a lot of buying power to uh, determine what policies get made and how they're implemented. Right. So who influences and implements policy? What else? What other ways does power manifest in our lives? How is it? How do you experience it like in the world? Money. Money. money how does money, money power work? Um, like you can put investments into whatever interests you want. Um, so if you have more wealth, then you have more power because you can put more of your money into your vested interests. Right. If you have money, you have money power, you can you can make it work for you in investing it. What happens if you don't have money in the world that we live in? How does life work for you? <laughs> no. Bad, right? It's hard, right? <laughs> like we live in a market society. Uh, you know, nobody, unless you're like farming your own stuff to eat right you have to exchange money for commodities things like that and so it's it's not very hard how else does power manifest in the world that we live in dividing classes or dividing folks from like those that have and those that don't whether it's money or in whatever way and then kind of having folks that are in power have an power at the expense of, of others right so there's like uh there's like differential in access to resources. There's even like spatial geographic differences, right? Like where people get to live, um, sort of like maybe like there's more polluted areas where some people have to live, other people get to live in like quieter, cleaner areas, right? So 
the, I mean, people, it's a kind of like a simple question, but actually for me, I always return to this question like all the time. Like what is power? How does it play out? Um, what's on my mind recently is kind of watching like the campus protests that are happening, right? Like power manifesting in people basically like trying to exercise speech and organize themselves from kind of the grassroots in university settings and like feeling like the police, like really leaning on them, campus administrators, like the use of violence, like the Congress attacking college students. Like it, to me, that's like the best expression of like power at play, right? You see like people contesting for ideas and other people pushing back on it. So um, there are a lot of ways to think about power. It can, uh, here's just like a few definitions, the ability to act, the ability to influence others, um, transforming things um, is power. Uh, relational capacity, right? So we live in a social world. So a lot of our sort of like differentials have to do with relating to one another. They're relative to one another. So power is expressed in a very social way. And then um, one of the ways that in like philosophy and literature that power actually isn't talked about that much, which is kind of weird because it's probably the way it's expressed most in our world is how our struck our, our basically our systems that we live in and reproduce the world are structured. Um, we kind of treat it as accident that things are the way that they are, or that a wall exists here and it's been there since I was born, must be natural, as opposed to right, like somebody built the wall for a reason, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, whenever we talk about policy, uh power is like really, really deeply embedded in in that. Um, and I wanna we will probably continue to like bring it up over the next couple of um, days. And then just another term that's, I think, useful to understand is the term hegemony, which basically just means that when one sort of group has power to shape so much power in society that they can like legitimate their ideas and norms to make them almost unquestioning. And uh, for me, when I think about opportunities for something like a Green New Deal, um, a lot of that means undermining accepted norms that people more or less just sort of assume must continue into the future. And, um, you know, I think it's good to be a student of history and to understand that the world that we inhabit now, many of the institutions that build it, although many of them are decaying and falling apart, if we're talking about like government, um, those are all like 50, 60 year old institutions at most, right? These are, these are things that were designed in our like parents and grandparents um, um, lifetimes. And so they actually haven't existed forever and they may not exist forever. And so we, we can change them. And, uh, Mitch talked about that a little bit last week as it relates to economy. What is regulation really closely related to the idea of policy? Mitch talked about it a little bit last week as well. What does this word mean? And who are regulators? Yeah, Mary. I can think of like, so we have these policies that are going to drive, you know, the policy behind some sort of law. And then the regulation is like how it's actually implemented on the ground. And like there's the regulators and then there's regulated, which we often think of how this like, industry and whether that's like how you build a building or like how you limit your emissions or how you honor workplace safety, like those regulations are a reflection, a hard concrete reflection. Policy. Right. And would people hear that okay on the on, online? It's okay if not, I can. <laughs> Somewhat. Okay. So Mary's answer to who regulator is was basically about like the people whose job it is once policy is implemented to make sure that the rules and regulations are followed. Um, and that exists in many different ways in the environmental world where Mary and I both work. Those are usually like people who work for the city, the state or the federal government who like uh, there are rules that tell like a polluter what to do. And then these people are supposed to ensure that that's actually what's happening. Um, what else? What else is regulation in the world that we live in? So from the chat, we have control, enforcers, the police. Right, the police, what do the police regulate? Right, like ostensibly like crime, but yeah, that's formally, that's what they do. What do they do in actuality? Like beyond just sort of like, if a law is broken, the cop will show up. Yeah. 
They regulate people, right. They're like a group of people who have guns and uniforms and the legitimacy to use violence under our system who can do a lot of sort of like shifting people around throughout the day, um, allowing access to space and things like that. And so if you spend time downtown in Portland or something like that, you will see, if you watch the police just kind of like on the day-to-day -day basis, they're kind of like moving around, like shuffling people around, usually houseless people, um, sort of like, even when they're not like turning the lights on and like arresting somebody, they they imply force, right? So police are a good example of regulators and regulation can be somewhat arbitrary in that case too, right? It doesn't always have to be, I mean, we know now a lot more just from like videos and watching this stuff happen that there can be arbitrary regulation too. It doesn't always have to be like, there are rules and then people are following those things. Um, so I like, when I think about regulation, I like to think about it a little bit more broadly than just like the, the formal officials who take the law and make it like work. Um, and that is definitely one part of what regulation is. If you're in a lawyer, you would think about regulation like that. Or if you work in a government bureaucracy, you'd almost exclusively think about regulation like that. But for me, um, I pull from, there's a Harvard professor called uh, Lawrence Lessig, who uh, this was, I don't know, like 20 something years ago now, but he wrote an article called, or a book called Code is Law. And he started making arguments basically about how cyberspace was going to be like in the future from his perspective was going to be like how things are ordered and shaped. And so he started to make, use the analogy of like architecture or the example of architecture as regulation in the future, which was groundbreaking at the time. Now it's almost like, you know, second nature to us. We know like algorithms change what you see and um, you can get banned from certain outlets and things like that. But at the time it was something that was a little bit uh, less well known. But he made several points about different ways that regulation actually works in the world around us, um, aside from just law and, and formal policy. So social norms is one way. What are social norms? Right. They're like background cultural principles that guide behavior. What happens if you violate a social norm in a society? Yeah, there's like social consequences, right? So like, um, can anybody think of an example of a social norm that's like often not illegal, but like is something that you get like pushback from if you do it in public? Right, some places like, you know, if you're not lining up correctly, that could be something to get punished for. People would look at you a little bit sassily perhaps. Um, how about like smoking? Right. Like some places, I mean, smoking went from being sort of like against social norms and then later on became sort of like codified as being against the law and later on. So sometimes things will start as like being um, taboo in a social sense and then they'll become formally outlawed. Right. Um, markets. We talked last week a lot about markets, um, but how do markets regulate? It's a lot. It's really related to what uh, Madeline was saying about money power. Right. So like uh, who owns a home in Portland, for example, <laughs> what happens if you don't own a home <laughs> and you live in a city? Right. You're like you you're at the mercy of landlords. Oftentimes, unless you have like a city that's protecting with regulation, if the rent goes up, that can impact your life dramatically. You might have to get moved around in space because like the market dictates. Right. So. Uh, the market is like acting on us all the time. How, or we just went, lived through a period of like really intense inflation, right? Like, so costs of like food and like basic needs and gas and things like that are really improving, or excuse me, improving. They're increasing, um, improving in some people's minds, I'm sure. Um, and those things are impacting the way that we behave, right? Because we react in response to what the market tells us versus like what we can pay, what we're paid to do, right? Um, and one that I think is really important that is often not discussed is architecture. And this is going to feed into a lot of what Sam is going to talk about tonight as well um, with the way that we structure space through our land use policies. But architecture is like walls, buildings, government buildings, prisons, like bridges, how we divert rivers and waterways and things like that. Um, 
And this has, I mean, there's enormous impacts on the way that we live our lives and how we move and where we're allowed to go. Um, and it's largely not acknowledged, I would say, as like a regulation, right? We sort of treat it. I mean, some people, if you're a geographer or if you're an architect, these are things that are like on your minds a lot. But for most people, like urban space or how buildings are constructed for access and things like that are not often on people's minds. And so I want to add that as something to consider for policy as well. So when we're talking about regulation, we're talking about policy, oftentimes we'll be talking about like going to the government and like trying to government, get the government to like pass a law to do something. And, and honestly, it's really important. But all these other things that exist in our, our social lives that we kind of like give over to different entities, or we just don't have the ability to influence maybe because like, for, for example, in the market, it's like a sphere. It's sometimes it's like walled off from democratic influence, right? They still regulate us and they still regulate the world around us. So if we're going to change things and make them more just and equitable, we have to figure out ways to do these things at the same time that we go to the government and say, you know, change this law or whatever. Yeah. Let's say, I'm confused about what the center is on the chart and like the differences, like what is it? What yeah. So basically um, this, imagine that the centerpiece is like a person and these are like different forces of regulation that are acting on a person at any given time. These, di these uh, diagrams are basically supposed to show that like sometimes, you know, like these, these areas of regulation do influence one another as well. So like, like I was saying before, smoking used to be a social norm and then it became a law. So like you can have a norm become a law or a law can influence how norms are done, right? So maybe if there's not any cops around to arrest you for breaking the law or something, other people might get mad at you if you break the law. Uh, if you've ever been to Germany and try to jaywalk, this is one that's like extremely funny. Like Germans just like hate the concept of jaywalking. It's like one of the most taboo things that you can do. So you could be like looking and there's like a mile down the street in either direction, there's nobody there. And if you cross the street, like an old lady will like chastise you and stuff like that. It's like probably technically illegal. Uh, and then markets and law are pretty interesting because markets don't actually just exist on their own, even though in our way of thinking about the world, the, the people who benefit from markets like to present them as like natural law. Um, because that's, if you benefit from something, you want to make it so that people don't want to change it. So you're not going to benefit. So you create stories and narratives about it. Um, but the law actually does create markets oftentimes and, and basically protects them, uh, things like contracts, for example, and the concept of private property. These are things that are created by government and basically like enforced by the people with guns and the court system. And without those kind of like things that are a part of public infrastructure, markets can't actually exist because if you can't agree to a contract and force a contract, it's hard to like do commerce, right? And so even some things that feel like they're really in the area of markets, if you look deep enough, they also have to do with like really, they might be like old principles of government that were unlikely to change in the immediate future, but there's still principles of governance that are in law as well. Is that helpful, Mel? Okay. Um, so just, yeah, some pictures. I, I said words to um, approximate this, but right, like walls, border fences, this is architecture that's regulating space. Again, you know, uh, with eyes on Gaza right now, it's like one of the examples of like a population in the world that's like enclosed in a walled system and technologically surveilled. And so even when like direct regulation isn't happening, in like a government sense, there's all of this architecture around that's basically like regulating people's lives. Um, freeways, um, we live in car culture land in the United States and most people kind of take it for granted that we just have these like big giant freeways um, running through our urban areas, but they came from somewhere, they had to be created. Um, they don't have to be there either. We could change our minds as societies and get rid of them. Um, they also, in addition to like moving automobiles and goods and supplies and all that kind of stuff and emitting carbon as well, they separate communities. And actually the highway system is a really good example of sort of like subtle, uh, at least for some subtle racism expressed through formal public policy investment, where there are tons of examples around the United States and in Portland of highway systems being explicitly driven through 
like poorer communities, uh, black communities, other communities, uh, either to disrupt communities like intentionally and make the, it harder for people to live or uh, in the 60s during the civil rights movement, there was a lot of activism and people actually like built highway systems to like separate downtown areas and commercial areas from black neighborhoods. It's like kind of like building a moat to protect a castle, to make it more difficult for people to be able to like do action that would impact markets. And so um, oftentimes with architecture, there's a story behind it, even if it feels like it, it doesn't have a story behind it, or if it feels really straightforward, sometimes there are like secondary and tertiary reasons why something might exist. Uh, and then, you know, like, again, I'm, I'm talking about gauze a lot cause it's on my mind, but, um, like literally we're changing digital architecture because young people are using digital architecture and are getting crazy ideas in their minds. And like the government is like, we have to like forcibly take this architecture away from people because it's like causing problems for us. Right. Or, um, my friends who work in tech tell me that this is not the case, but I'm like still kind of think that the the Twitter thing was similarly like about making it harder for like liberals or leftists to use social architecture and communicate um, by basically like taking it. I mean, if you, if you still use it, I still do. It's like a cesspool compared to what it used to be. It's like really like vicious place. Um, but this is the way that a lot of people like get their information, they communicate, right? So it's like, somewhat ephemeral compared to maybe like how we physically walk across a bridge or something like that but digital architecture is massively important in our in our modern lives as well so anyway uh that's like a sort of a different way of seeing regulation and then um this is a quote from something that none of you have read probably so um maybe you want to if you're like into reading about marxist philosophy or something but um I like this quote that says the organization of social reproduction on the basis of capital itself gives rise to a set of powerful mechanisms which tend to reproduce the relations of production. So basically, like I was saying before, we live in a system like called capitalism and the biggest influences in how things are done come from people who have the most money and or are influential in large institutions that control and move a lot of money. Um, that's how our system is structured. and that system doesn't just kind of like exist to keep things exactly as they are. It has the people within those systems have goals and their goal primarily is to make money and they exercise through the levers of public policy and other forms of regulation to create a system that makes that easier for them over time. Right. So, um, you know, it's not like we live in sort of like a neutral world where things happen for accidental reasons. And uh, oftentimes, you know, when things feel a little bit unexplainable, you apply a lens like this, they make a lot more sense. Okay, so with that all said, what's policy? Hinted at it a little bit, but what is it? You wanna talk, but you have pizza in your mouth, <laughs> I can tell. It's just the rules that we were talking about. Right. So this is like when regulation is written down, basically, right, by people who have some kind of like legitimacy, right? And in our system, we ostensibly live in democratic systems. So people who are elected to formal positions of power can make policy and often do. Um, they make policy in line with large sort of like commercial institutions. So um Let's take an example, like when Governor Tina Kotek decided that they were going to come up with like a plan for downtown Portland, right? She like created a space and like invited a bunch of people. Some of those people like worked at downtown businesses or were big like industrial, um, I don't know, captains of industry, I guess. Um, the, lo the local example, it's like, uh, for Portland, uh, they might run footwear companies and things like that, but they, they got invited and then some other like community leaders got invited and then people got in a room and basically came up with recommendations, which in that instance were like, let's cut taxes, which didn't really seem like it met the needs of what was going on. But, but that's, that's one way you can do it is you can just have like a big group of people get together. Right. Uh, or we, um, 
people talk about, like we talked on the first day about like just transition frameworks, like a just transition framework for policymaking might actually not just be like, let's get a bunch of powerful people together in a room and let them kind of hash out what their interests are. It might be to intentionally select people that are not perceived as having a lot of social power in ordinary senses and like involving them really early in the contours of what a policy might make and then kind of like involving more powerful stakeholders later on in a public policy process. And that has been done in Portland recently uh, to little avail, unfortunately, so far, but there was a um, policy initiative at the city of Portland that eventually became called the HEART Standards. And it's an acronym that I can never remember what it actually stands for, but it was basically about like how we're gonna regulate indoor spaces, buildings for like health purposes in, in Portland. And there was like a year of stakeholder outreach that was done really, really intentionally and involved a lot of voices from marginalized communities. And they came up with recommendations. And then that went into kind of like broader stakeholder groups that involved like business develop, uh, like housing developers and the gas utilities and all sorts of other folks. And eventually the politics militated against doing anything because the city is bad right now. But um, that was like an example of something that might've been a model for doing this kind of policy. And it just hasn't turned into to, um, full expression yet. So uh, here's just like a, a dictionary definition of what policy is. A set of ideas or a plan of what to do in a particular situation that have been agreed to officially by a group of people, a business organization, a government or a political party. That's like a pretty good definition of policy. Um, and policy and law are not exactly the same things. Um, if you wanna quibble about it, um, but they're pretty closely related. And both of them are expressions of power um, or the way I would think about it is they're the end result of negotiations and compromises between the most politically powerful people and institutions in society, right? So, um, and, you know, to kind of reference the, the piece about like justice and prioritizing marginalized communities in the history of this country, that has never been done as an act of charity, that's not something that people, people don't give up power willingly. They may make shows of giving up power or do things to sort of demonstrate how nice and charitable they are that look a lot like power that are not actually power, but actually to influence power, you have to build it. And so, um, you know, a lot of what we'll talk about in the, the ending sessions, like, how do you actually do that? Like, how do you go from the standpoint of being like, I would really like to change the world. I'm just one or a member of a few groups of people. We don't have a bunch of money. Like how do we actually get together and like take our ideas and express those in the real world through policy and through regulation. Um, but that's what it is. Like the world is always moving and it's never stagnant. It's always changing. Um, and power in the ways that we talked about it is, is that force that kind of like is moving through us all, I guess, uh, into our formal institutions, which are moving money and they're moving resources and they're like creating the architecture that we live in. Um, so it's really important stuff. Uh, and then just, I'm like doing really well on time. So um, <laughs> this is remarkable for me. Um, so just to like, I'll stop. We can talk about this. Are there questions or comments about where we've gone so far. Yeah, Mary. Looking back at the modalities of regulation that you showed and how there's like social norms, law, markets, and architecture, and like how law, markets, and even architecture seem like premised on like social norms and maybe social norms being the only, the most like independent, you know, organic modality, if you will. And like what we're seeing now as a lot of our policies fail because they're like premised on traditional notions of power and who has it and who doesn't. Like, it seems like a very interesting inflection point where to make more effective policy, you have to like really disrupt the social norms and like really prioritize those not having, those who have historically not been afforded any power. And like, you know, that, that also comports with like right now we're in the, the midst of a huge culture war and like, so much of that is premised on like really wording historical social norms and like is that like does that make advancing 
good policy as, as we would talk about it, like harder or? Yeah, so, and were people able to hear that? Okay, in the in the chat? What was it really good? Okay, good job, Mary. You projected your voice, excellent. People could hear you. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because ostensibly like we live in a, like a democratic society, right? Like ostensibly, um, it doesn't feel like that way all the time um, or ever to me personally, but it's you know ostensibly true that you can like get into the political system and change things, we've seen it happen a lot. Um, and I've been like, it's a little bit of an aside, but I was thinking about life during COVID a lot recently in preparation for this class and kind of how things changed and um, kind of what you were talking about. I mean, you, you may not be talking about these actual exact social norms, but like the social norm of like, we expect like to freely move about as we want to. I don't go to the mall whenever I want to. I don't go to the store whenever I want to. Like that kind of stuff is just like a basic part of life and just like seeing people um, and being in person and, and that basically being taken away for an extended period of time because people were responding to, you know, like a pandemic and trying to take public health um, precautions and things like that. And like, I feel like some part of society, like a good part of society here and abroad at first were like, okay, that seems legitimate. Like, let's try to team up and do that. But eventually people like decided they didn't want to do that anymore. And um, there were, it wasn't just like an accident. Like there was definitely a background feeling that people were having and people were feeling pent up and lonely and stuff. And, and it definitely influences things. But the, I feel like one of the first things that happened is like the business communities were like, this is bad for business. And like basically started putting pressure around like opening up markets and like trying to get rid of lockdowns, right? And so some of that initial pressure came there. And then you had, other folks that for like whatever their reasons would like kind of like push back. And then now it's kind of like a mess and there's a lot of like conspiratorial stuff, but it kind of felt like the immune system of like the market or something like that was like activating in response to during the pandemic. And then anyway, so I've been like mm -hmm. thinking about these metaphors where like, it feels to me like that kind of clarified in my mind, but climate change is another one. Like climate change is not, like accident, it's the natural result of the economy that we run. Like it's the thermodynamic response of like creating a certain type of order in a way that like uses a bunch of energy and releases carbon dioxide. So it's like creating a thermo, like a physically predictable thermodynamic reaction if you think in the terms of physics. And in 2019, people were like really pushing for a green new deal. If you remember in Portland, we passed the clean energy, fund like a few a year before we've been doing all this regulation i was in a meeting i probably use this anecdote way too much but i went to a conference in vancouver and there were some planners from the bureau of planning sustainability there teaching people how they do power mapping this was have been 2018 and they had a big list of all the stakeholder groups that they identified in the city of portland and they were like the influential powerful group that they saw they were like climate activists are like a stronger influence over our public policy than like the Portland Business Alliance, like all the connection of all the industrial people. Whether that is true or not, that was their perception inside of the city. They were like, we have to be answerable to the climate people. And um, I mean, it's amazing like achievement on its own, but like in 2024, it feels like there's been some backlash to that, right? And people have kind of figured out like, well, if we're going to adapt, we might have to make changes. Institutions have kind of like prompted people to resist certain changes. Um, we don't really do like climate denial in the sense that it doesn't happen anymore. It's more like, it's like uh, back to sort of like inequality and like climate protections for some, but not others. And it kind of like reverts back to those social norms that you're talking about. So be like, well, let's just let, let things fall where they may and rich people can buy Teslas and mm -hmm. They can have police like protect them when there's disorder and Amazon will drone their products to them however they get there. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in that circle of affluence, then it's, but that's just nature. That's just the market at work. So like, how can you complain about that? Right? Like, so it feels like, and then, but if you try to change policy, then, you know, like all this money comes in, all these like 
groups of people who have different concerns try to stop it. So anyway, this is a long-winded way of saying like how things are, the trajectory that they're on, yes. Like there's always going to be an inertia that's like easier to stay on that. And if you try to divert from that at all, there's so many institutions that have built up over time to protect their interests and in maintaining a system. So it's a huge fight. But the good news is, you know, I'm 40 now. So um, in my lifetime, I've seen like a half a dozen times where it actually felt like we could make like big change and started to make big change. And it hasn't like really flipped over so that it feels like it, but these opportunities are going to continue to happen. And so um, I think we're in a little bit of a reactionary mode right now, but it will change. And like, people need to be ready to like take advantage and like leap over the hurdles that have been stopping us so far. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, I would just add like two things that in the in policy, it's a game of shall versus should. Should is should have put a what a. That's a waste of space on paper, in my opinion. Um, and so typically those in power fight over the shalls. And that is where industry will come hard at you. And your only objective is to try to get the shall in. And then the other game is the and versus the or. And you're really trying to get the and to try and get as much protect as many protections as you possibly can for health and safety versus the or, which industry will definitely come at and say, well, what if we did this section and or we did this alternative way of meeting what you're saying? And so that seems to be the game, I think, that in policy that we typically see. And so, you know, I see all these shells right here, but that's where you know, regulators can actually say, oh, we have solid ground to enforce or to deny or approve whatever is being requested. But I would say, I mean, a poll just came out. I would say, don't be hard, don't be hard on this movement because I would say the what the Portland Business Alliance or lobbyists have poured into is really a negative campaign what the Portland Clean Energy Fund really showed is here's a solution for meaningful, tangible measures that can really make a difference on slowing down climate change, helping communities adapt to more frequent, more intense natural disasters. Um, and the poll just came out that shows that Portlanders have a 16% approval rating of the current city council. Guess what? The Portland Business Alliance has a majority on the council. They are no longer saying, look at Joanne, look at Chloe. They're ruining it all. No, this is you. This is your people. The voters are not happy with it. And so that's, that's something that I feel like, like good, like, I mean, you all and like Nick and the beautiful campaign strategists, the powers in the voter, right? The powers in the people and getting the persuadables to understand we have something you want. We have something that the majority of people are going to like and that are going to vote in support of. And we have done our research and we have figured out what the funding and financing instruments are for that. So I would say the, the ball's in their court right now. They're failing at it. And that is, I think, a really opportune organizing moment to say, pendulum's going to swing back. Um, you're failing. You're not putting anything in. Your platform is no new taxes. <laughs> Congrats. We can all call it that. Doing racism. They're never going to have the interest of like the majority of people in their platform for them. So, one way that like every time we have CBA or just any kind of more right leaning institution in power, even federally, as awful as the consequences are, like, every day for everyone who wants to live under that regime, it is like for organizers an opportunity to really get at the heart of what people what people are needing and getting. They will not be getting it under yeah. The kind of perpetuation of this current economy. Yeah. Thanks for both those comments. Yeah, it's if you haven't seen it yet, just go read the organ. It's a really funny poll. It's like it's, there's other funny stuff to it. They'd be like, the Oregonian's been like trying to attack the county chair for like a year straight. And they've like succeeded in giving your stomach, you know, fairly high disapproval ratings. But like, 
they don't talk about the city nearly as much. And like the city's got like 70% disapproval rating or something like that. It's ridiculous. Um, and I would say like that again, the power connections, like the editor at the Oregonian is the board chair for the Metro chamber. So you, when you look at, okay, your organization funded a poll and it is showing disapproval ratings, it's that much disapproval on your own strategy. Great, keep funding those polls. Yeah. Yep, we would like to know more about yeah. this. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk for like, mm, like 10 minutes more uh, about just some like basic concepts as we get into policy stuff, because kind of where we're going with this class is that um, we're gonna we're gonna be talking a lot about like what's possible at the the most accessible levels of our government, which is like local government mostly. So city, county, metro level governments where people are more accessible, they're kind of like districtly elected now in all of those local governments. And, um, you know, their seats of government are like where we live, we don't have to drive 45 minutes to go talk to people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so understanding what's possible um, has some of that has to do with like situating yourself in like the federalist system that we live under and understanding kind of like where do people normally say you have power versus like what could we really like do if we wanted to push it and, and carve ourselves up some more power so uh one of the basic um like concepts in understanding that is the supremacy clause of the u.s constitution and basically it just says that the u.s laws or the the constitution and the laws of like the federal government the laws of the land um, and then we live in a system of federalism, which in the constitution, there's also like a series of powers that are like given explicitly to Congress, um, like raising taxes and, uh, printing money and, uh, well, I guess printing money is not actually in there, but, um, and, uh, immigration law and things like that. And then there are powers that are reserved to the little S states, the 50 states, right? So that's, there's already some delineation there, um, but the way that this generally looks is that there's like an order of things that are what what are called like preempting other areas of law, and basically it's like a hierarchy from the top down to the lower levels of government. So like the Constitution, plus how courts interpret that is like at the highest level. What happens in Congress, the laws that they pass is like the next highest. The federal administrations and the rules and the regulations they pass are the third and then state constitution, state statutes, state administrative rules, and then city and county. Right. And so it doesn't look exactly like this in some systems and actually like land use in Oregon is one of those where there's a lot of like exchange between like local and state in ways that are like just written into the state law. So it is like not exactly conforming to this, but this is like the basic rule that you can start with if you're like hmm i want to figure out like if i could do this thing in my local government you would kind of start to see you'd basically like look to see if there's anything called a preemption um in federal or state government we have uh also in oregon you all probably can't see this rule because there's like stuff in the way but um it's called home rule authority and so Home rule authority, uh, local governments aren't written into the federal constitution at all. There's federal government and there's state government. And that's the sort of like duality of federalism. And then, you know, there was a civil war that was fought over, what was it fought over? Was it fought over states' rights? Uh, slavery, right? As a expression of uh, basically like our right to hold slaves as states, um, which is, you know, if you ever hear somebody say that the civil war was fought over state rights, like walk away or leave their presence, uh, call it somebody else. Um, but um, local governments are like creations of state governments, basically. They're like municipal corporations is one way that they're called. So they don't have their own constitutional authority. It totally depends on what the state does. Uh, so in Oregon, um, Voters actually, I think by initiative, initially created the first home rule authority, which I can't remember the year, it was over hundred years ago. And basically they were like, we should have self-government in local areas, which probably wasn't good, honestly, when they started doing this. But in terms of like uh, principles of like 
access to government are good for us now. Um, and so the Home Rule Authority basically says that unless the state tells you explicitly or there's like some kind of program that implies it so directly, you can do a lot as a local government. You can regulate for public health, safety, morals, and welfare, which is like a huge amount of activity that you could possibly regulate. Uh, you can license and you can tax. And these are these are called police powers of local governments. Um, and there's also county governments um, have similar authority. And in fact, well, according to me and my research, they have more power than people understand because there was a state law um, it was called the Health Modernization Act that was passed like 10 years ago, eight years ago or something like that. And basically it says that a local public health authority can establish um, ordinances and rules related to public health matters. So like so many of our like social problems are like at least conceivable as public health matters. You can use that lens. Hi. Um, and so county governments actually have a lot of authority to take on things like climate change or uh, environmental justice. Um, our county government is like suing the fossil fuel industry because over the heat dome event from, uh, was that 2021? And um, there's a lot that they can do. We are a part of a group of people lobbying them to take more action on like um, emissions related to gas infrastructure, both indoor and outdoor, because there's just a lot of toxics that are exposed and the county could do that. Uh, they would face political hurdles in doing it because the gas utility does not want that to happen. Um, they want their business model to continue, but I think they could. Um, they can regulate tobacco, they can regulate wood smoke. So anyway, this local governments, um, I remember, I don't know if I should name him because he's running for city council again, but there was a city councilor um, when I was a young tyke, when I was like 30 and was starting to get into Portland level politics the issue that I got like activated on was there were all these coal export facilities in the Pacific Northwest. And there was one that was, they were trying to site it at the part of Moro to move coal. And so there'd be like uncovered coal cars, like moving throughout the region, just like spraying coal everywhere. Um, and everybody hated it except for the coal companies and the few companies in the city that were making the cars that they were going to move them on. Um, and then the PR firms that they were paying a whole bunch of money to tell us why it was good. And we went to our city governments and we were like, hey, let's like come up with local ways of doing stuff. And they were like, we can't do anything. It's like federal issues and stuff like that. And they were so, they were so unhelpful. And they were like 100% wrong too, which is the other thing. So there's like, it depends on who you talk to around this kind of stuff. If you talk to somebody who like, went to law school and like read their like constitutional law book and never thought beyond that. There's a lot of stuff that they might just be like, I learned that, that like this thing is not allowed because it's read it in textbook, but actually there's just like a lot here. And we're lucky in Oregon, we have way more access at the local government and we have like uh, regional transit agencies that we can influence. It's harder, but we can influence them. We can influence like, so there's like four levels of government or quasi government, like that are immediately accessible to us if we can like organize well enough to influence them. And they cover like every subject that, except we can't set criminal laws. That's basically like the one thing that you can't do um, at local level. Um, but everything else is, is there for us. So, um, let me see if I have anything else. Yeah. It's less common across the country. Yeah, like it would be really hard to do the Portland Clean Energy Fund in a lot of big cities around the country because their their restrictions on like local taxing can be really onerous. Um, and for us, I mean, our legislature like actually tried to make it so that nobody else could do a piece up by putting a preemption in a, a student as a funding bill. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I was really, it was not excited. Right. But yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, in a lot of communities, it's much harder than it is for us in, in Portland. Um, and the land use system too, makes a lot of this stuff more accessible because like, local government's going to make a comprehensive plan and they get a, like a lot of like 
and they then that means they can really influence the way that they're like ordinances are written and things like that. Um, I'm going to give a couple of caveats around local power and regulation just so that they're out there in the back of your mind somewhere. One is that um, just because we can regulate doesn't mean we could necessarily afford it in all cases. So like we can, under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, the way that the Supreme Court is amended or interpreted it, um, this what's called the takings clause, where you can you can take take public or private property for public use. You have to pay just compensation. The Supreme Court basically says that that applies to regulations that are not fully taking people's property if they like take the value of property away. So like. A local government can be like, we're going to build an easement like for a bike trail across somebody's land or something like that. You like pay them the value of that. Or, um, you know, one thing that I like half joke about, but I'm also kind of serious about is like the city could probably condemn Zenith and like, like under do just like take their property away. We'd have to pay them a bunch of money though. And so there are things that the government can do, but we would, it's like, prohibitively expensive under the way that our constitution is uh, understood. There are caveats to that, um, but in general, that's like one danger is just like regulating in such a way that it deprives a company of property. Um, and if you were a property lawyer, this would be very, very interesting for you, but just be aware of it. Um, and then there are also ways that the market can discipline local governments. And so one of those is uh, bond ratings. So every city has a municipal bond rating. And basically this is like a rating that a private credit rating agency gives to a city um, for its like its ability to pay back investors who are, are bondholders if they buy a municipal bond. Um, it's in the like technical details of finance, but it's if you followed what happened in the 2008 financial crash with how uh, ratings agencies were basically doing fraud in order to rate um, like financial instruments that were like toxic as like triple A ratings so that they could like stimulate market activity. This is technically possible within this realm too. And so like if you had let's like a crazy, like awesome, like, you know, let's say you had a renaissance in a city and they were just like, fuck it. Like we are doing a green new deal. Like there are ways that like private entities could like discipline. Them. And so these are the things that are like in the details of big strategy. Like if you actually had the juice and you actually have the movement energy to go big, like you can't just expect that like if it's legal, that there are not gonna be sort of like market-based um, repercussions. And uh, our system is like for the last 40, 50 years is designed explicitly to make more and more of these kind of like levers of market um, discipline over governments. That's, there's a word, it's called neoliberalism that you might hear thrown around every once in a while if you go to like a political philosophy cl class. And pretty much everywhere else in the world, that's the term that they use to describe the last like 45 years of econ global economic system. But in the US, we don't use that word in education that much unless you like are in a political philosophy class. But basically what that means is that starting in the 1970s, there was this move to, to unwind the last New Deal, which had a lot of like social programs and um, had like Social Security and it had uh, a lot of like labor protections and all these things. It was, we were close to full employment in the 60s, et cetera, et cetera. And basically they were like, we're not going to do that economy anymore. We're going to do an economy that's based on debt and it's based on uh, market actors having more and more freedom under the system. So dismantling some of those like social networks and enhancing the, the power of private um, folks who operate in the market. And so, I mean, it's ingeniously designed, unfortunately. So there are levers that they can pull on to, to, to discipline local government. So I just don't want to present it as, as that like, city can do whatever it wants, right? If we get like all the people that we want, we still have to be really tactically smart about what we push on, when we push on it and where we go, because we have to do a dance with state government who can always preempt us if they get too mad. And we just saw what they did with like Measure 110 and 
like a reactionary state government. The state government's always going to be more conservative than our local governments, just because that's how it works. So we have to do a dance with them. And then we also have to do a dance with the federal government as well, which is always going to be more conservative than we are here. That being said, there is still a lot that we can do um, in this in this city. So um, in the syllabus, I linked a bunch of stuff that I really did not expect anybody to read uh, like in depth before this class, but there's like the Green New Deal network has a bunch of like model policy. So if you're just kind of curious to see what people are calling like Green New Deal, state and local uh, policies, like that's just a great resource to kind of sift through for information and inspiration. And similarly, I copied a chapter out of a law textbook for you um, that shows kind of like how different cities are like taking on climate change. And it's like stuff from like building codes and land use to like, banning fossil fuel infrastructure. There's like just really interesting things to kind of like wrap your mind around. You don't have to be an expert in it, but they're just like, it kind of tells you what people are trying and what's working under our current system. And then there's also like an OECD um, report that I didn't link in the syllabus, but you could find it easily just by OE OECD policy instruments for the environment. So there are a lot of people putting these resources out. You don't actually have to be a lawyer to like read and understand these policies. There's like a little bit of a learning curve up front for like getting the lingo and the approach and stuff. But I promise me it's like accessible and there, there are plenty of people here and in our networks that are like happy to help you like work through it if you ever get really excited about just like learning this stuff. Um, okay, that's it for me. Let's take just like a three, four, five minute break. Uh, I'm gonna eat a piece of pizza and then we'll come back and Sam will talk to us about land use in a few minutes. Format too, I think it gets uh, wider than a typical. Let's see, I bet it'll work. I also need that. Oh, yeah, no problem. Is there somewhere to read the article? Um, that's a good question. I don't actually know. I just moved in here. Let me check yeah. for people can find this. Uh, I can refill it in the bathroom. Here's the question. So, like, in the kitchen, there's water and ground waters. They have filtered water, but I'm not sure. So, I think they do have mm -hmm. how to get like filtered. So, I'm like, I can help say. Okay. <laughs> Madeline knows more about my office. Well, I don't. I just want to try. Oh, yeah, I can't find out. Oh, okay. So, is the local that represents the local I didn't know. I don't know if you want to. I'll show you the Yeah, I would say I would. Just like, maybe I want to see the stuff. I already asked you. Yeah, going to a friend's birthday party. What's up? Yeah. What is it? It's like that. Yeah, and maybe see does it's like it starts with a bike stand oh, cool. and then it ends up migration on this like the graph like yeah. Oh okay. I mean you'll have a great day of it, like a great sunny day. Yeah.
Okay. We good? Cool. All right. Well, they, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, this is great to be here and um, just really grateful to Nick and Richa for organizing this opportunity and Breach Collective for hosting. Um, I think it's because you kicked it off and I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, I'm Sam Diaz for those who haven't, I haven't met and um, I'm executive director at 1000 Friends. A little bit about my background is I've worked for a California governor, uh, Edmund Brown Jr., um, who really focused on climate change. It's very interesting to hear Nick talk about the dynamic between state control and, lo and local control. He was a very big believer that the cities needed to deal with their messes and the state would back out. Um, and the state's role was really focused on like bigger issues like climate change and these global problems. And when you're, when you're the fourth largest economy in the world, you take that type of position. Um, I've also worked in philanthropy at Resources Legacy Fund. Uh, it's a philanthropy that actually pulls resources from the Walton Family Foundation, the Hewlett, the Packards, um, puts them together and then gives them to environmental organizations. So I've seen a little bit of the belly of the beast, um, uh, but also like seeing amazing grantees. And that was really what inspired me um, day to day to be there was just see the organizers, the advocacy, the campaigns. Um, and then I worked in Portland Mayor Wheeler's office uh, during COVID um, and the amazing, beautiful protests for racial justice. And also on many of the changes in our city to rewrite the rules to make our neighborhoods more affordable, more accessible, um, and just more connected, uh, more more um, inclusive. Um, so, and we kind of snuck in those uh, during the pandemic. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the specific changes and then kind of what we can tee up um, together to reach a Green New Deal in the land use uh, kind of category of things. Um, and uh, I would say, I just want to give a shout out to my colleague, Cassie Wilson, who also is at a, a Thousand Friends of Oregon. She's our transportation policy manager. Um, we're really, we lucked out to have her. Uh, but if you have questions about a Thousand Friends, just reach out to us and we're happy to, to check in more. Um, so I think I, I am not going to go through the very like 19 land use goals Here's your act. Here's your you know land use law class for tonight. Um, this this group and those online can probably teach that class at this point. Um, I, but I do want to start out with just two things that I love talking about in terms of starting with our land use, which is our dirt here in Oregon and the Mona Lisa. And the first is because of the Missoula floods happened thousands of years ago. The floods deposited all of these amazing nutrients in our soils here in Oregon. It's why a blank slate of a uh, blank slate of land is the hardest thing to grow here in the Willamette Valley. Um, and so we just have amazing world class soils that honor that give us the stewards, um, uh, the farming opportunities, the ranching opportunities, forestry opportunities um, right here in our backyard in Oregon. Um, and the second is really thinking about the protections around those soils. And we have something called our urban growth boundary, uh, which is often talked about. And we can dive I, for, with this group. I generally don't go into detail, but I think with this group, I may. Um, and I can answer questions about that process and what it feels like and what it looks like. But um, we like thinking about it as a frame around a very beautiful picture. And if you get so focused on that frame, you're really going to lose what's inside that picture frame. And so really the energy and the oxygen should be focused on how do we help our cities build up and in rather than out and down. And all of those things that we need for our cities to succeed and for the residents to succeed in is really the zoning changes, you know, allowing um, development, putting some controls in place to say, if you're a private developer, you're going to profit in this town. Um, that there needs to be some sort of meaningful measures to give back, whether that is inclusionary housing, which is a policy that says if you build more than 20 units in the city of Portland, um, at least 20% of those need to be capital A affordable. There are other options that you can do to meet those affordability requirements. You could build uh, 
uh, off site at a different site, it needs to be substantially similar because we don't want to um, have a bunch of income segregation happening in our city. So it needs to be in a similar type of zone or you could pay fee in lieu. Um, and the biggest story as of late is the Ritz Carlton, um, which I have yet to step foot in. <laughs> um, I kind of like, I'm kind of grossed out by it at this point, but um, the Ritz Carlton is one of the first developer applicants to choose to pay the fee in lieu instead of building affordable homes, um, whether it was part of their building or whether it was off site, and they have yet to pay that fee. And they're actually trying to negotiate with the city and the electeds to get the fee to go down as much as possible. Um, and so they're just holding out. And they're, the reasoning that they give the city is, sorry, we're still waiting for these suites to be sold. Because go figure, there isn't a market for a $1.2 million suite in Portland. Um, so there's a bunch of vacant units sitting there and they still have not paid the fee. Okay, so all that to say is there's a lot to focus in on the frame of the city to really succeed um, and to really make sure the residents live, you know, have high quality of life here in Oregon. So um, all that to say is we didn't get here by accident. Um, and I will say the stewards who really take care of our soils, um, our farmers here are incredible. We get to work with them at a thousand friends of Oregon and straddle this urban rural um, bridge. 97% um, of farmers in Oregon are family farmers. They have local roots right here in Oregon. That is very unique compared to my home state of California, where you have really big corporations owning the land, sucking up the water, and then leaving for another site. So a lot of our members um, who are part of our forestry ag advisory committee, they want to see this land and carried on into farming. And they do a lot of succession planning. We get them resources to do that. Um, and quite frankly, I've talked to a lot of them because the average age of a farmer is about 64. And they, they don't care if it stays within the family. They just want to see the land stewarded um, into the next generation. And so there's a lot of people really interested in how do I connect with younger farmers? How do I support them? How do I, how do I connect them to my uh, loan officer at Farm Credit Services Union? Because there's going to be a drought. There's going to be a wildfire. There's going to be something that makes it very hard for them. And they're going to think about selling the farm and getting out of the business. And I don't want them to. And so there's a, a very great um, transition planning happening. And so I'd say the farmers, the foresters, the ranchers are all thinking about that. And we're just, you know, I am mesmerized um, by how they speak. And at first, when I took this job about three years ago, they hated talking about climate change. Um, the Green New Deal was very toxic to them. And then I think when they, you take a farmer's tour, you take a ranching tour, you learn that these are people on the front lines. They can talk about climate change. They can talk about changes in temperature and humidity and crop species that they need to plant now um, in water storage better than people at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. No offense to them. I love them. I was liaison to them, but they know it. They live it and they have to make changes and they have to adapt to it. And so um, I would say we have really come a long ways and they actually, many of them supported a natural climate solution fund, the first in Oregon for $10 million that we got last legislative session in order to help them adapt to this new scary normal um, and what that looks like. So more water and energy efficient equipment on the farm, more shading structures for farm workers, um, uh, whether that's like built shade or whether that's tree uh, groves, um, and so we'll see, you know, they, the best um, grantees are going to be putting forward here later this summer, where we're really excited that the state took an approach to say, you are our stewards, we need to honor this stewardship, and we need to help you adapt to this new normal. And all of a sudden, what we're seeing is they're happy to talk about climate change. They love it now because they understand, oh, that's helping me adapt. I'm not enemy number one. They're not trying to raise my fuel prices. They're trying to help me with these funds. And so it's been a really great lesson, I think, for our membership, for our board. Um, I want to share as loud as we can, because 
there is that common interest between our rural communities, the stewards of our lands, and uh, very much people who live, you know, all of us here in the city. Um, and I would say all of that is built on a 50 year uh, movement uh, here in Oregon. And um, this was uh, in the 60s when there were a lot of federal dollars, a lot for housing, for job creation, for transportation. That sounds eerily familiar because that's where we are right now. And so um, there was a rush by many states and local communities to get the federal money, go as fast as possible and build out. Build your highway expansions, build your suburban subdivisions, uh, try and get your warehouse and your strip malls. And all of a sudden in many states like mine uh, in California, you had a checkerboard of, of opportunity, of economic development. And you had all of these concerns crop up because you had these different uses that towns didn't thoughtfully and intentionally plan for. And in Oregon, because of the stewards that I mentioned, but because of environmentalists and urbanists that really loved the main street, that really loved centers and corridors, that really loved the fact that they could age in place, um, they all came together in the 60s and said, we're not doing what other states are going to do. We're going to go our own way. And so they rallied together, pressured and I would say got elected Tom McCall as governor at that time, and they passed Senate Bill 100 and 101. So it was a, a piece of two pieces of legislation that created this statewide land use system. And you know, one of the cornerstone pieces for Senate Bill 100 and 101 eventually turned into our urban growth boundary, which I just described. But it also said there are exclusive farm and forest use use zoning. So that's like the shalls and the shoulds. This is a shall. You shall not build commercial, industrial, residential on exclusive farm or forest use zoning. Don't even try. And so that was something that a clear, bright line, all of a sudden, now the stewards were protected and the cities had to turn inward to say, how are we going to deliver the housing and the jobs and the transportation? And we were still able to get federal money for that we were able to have these connected centers and corridors in our cities and towns. Now, since that legislation, there has been over 60 exceptions that the legislature and the governor had signed into law. So some of our farmers joke, this looks like Swiss cheese at this point, but I will say 90, over 95% of, of the land zoned as exclusive farm use are still in farm production. So that means that this law, these shells are working and that this constant enforcement and honoring the system is working. So I think it's, you know, it's always good to hear a good example of when it does work in our favor. Um, and just, you know, again, the power of this 50 year old movement that, you know, I've been lucky to, to join and participate in. Um, but I do want to say one of the main threats that we are facing um, is the hunt for federal dollars in this day and age. And one of the main bills that President Biden and Congress passed was the Chips and Science Act. And so you had this big pot of federal funding to try to bring in microchips, you know, and they t they say they always electives will always say it's in your phone, it's in your laptop, it's in your car. I'm like, yeah, it's also in Furbies. Like it's also in things you don't need. And so it's also in military equipment, right? And so that's the sort of thing where, um, you know, there's a question about need. We made a strategic decision to say, we're not gonna fight this on whether or not we want this Chips and Science Act money. I think the industry interests are too powerful. The politicians are lined up. You know, uh, Senator Wyden took a really big role in this. We don't really want to like go head to head with with the semiconductor industry on this. Instead, we're going to guide them in where their development should be. And so that's what we negotiated with Oregon Business Council legislative leadership and the governor um, two sessions ago in Senate Bill Four. And so Senate Bill Four now has safeguards in place 
that says you need to exhaust all of the industrial land inside existing urban growth boundaries before you even think about going outside the urban growth boundary. And that was a really important safeguard. The other safeguard we had was a sunset date. And so the sunset date is actually at the end of this year. So we've gone about a year and a half since the legislation was signed into law without any urban growth boundary expansion request. And I think tech companies are really saying, look, we have a sandbox. What we need is money. We don't need land. We need money. So state, give us money. That's all happening. We're kind of staying out of that again, because again, we're really focused on how do we guide this in ways that really um, that really bring a boost to some cities and towns. Um, and the other, I would say the other thing that we were able to bring, thanks to partners, thanks to elected officials throughout the state, was really filling this information gap. And one of the first things when this whole conversation about the Chips and Science Act started and how Oregon was going to compete was, do we have the industrial land we need? And typically we would have had, that's a fact, right? It's easy to find out, do we have the land or not? Well, somehow it was not an easy fact to go get from our State Department of Land Conservation and Development. Um, and so we had to scrounge and we ended up calling planning directors and mayors and cities across Oregon saying, hey, we think you have industrial land inside your urban growth boundary. Do you want a semiconductor expansion? Do you want to throw your hat in the ring? It was really great for all these mayors to get these calls because they didn't feel heard or connected with the state on these. So all of a sudden, now we have mayors in very red areas of the state say, hey, we like a thousand friends. They're calling us and they're they're thinking of us and we may get high quality jobs here. Sure, we'll we'll come to the table. And so we ended up finding, again, that common interest with a lot of these electeds and these community leaders who typically maybe we would have sued on another day, but on this issue, we really agreed on. And we were able to go to the Joint Committee on Semiconductors and say, there's over 10,000 acres of land zoned industrial right now inside our urban growth boundaries that is ready. Go, go forward. Congratulations. We filled the gap. And all of a sudden, the lobbyists for industry backed away and they became very quiet, tail between the legs, because they had been saying, we're all out of land, we're all out of land. And we, we, proved, we proved it wrong. And so that was, I think, the, that was how we got to the negotiating table as a small nonprofit um, with, you know, some of the biggest, like in, the intels, literally the intels of the world. And so um, I do think that the land use system offers the fact finding and that fact finding is so important. That's why we have people like Mary in the movement and we have attorneys helping us you know, really complete the record on these land use debates and these decisions in order for us to negotiate with the powers that be um, on these. Um, and I love talking about the flip side too, because I got, you know, we got to talk about, you know, the ladies of Main Street and Baker City or just, you know, towns like Baker City. Oregon has actually a number of award-winning Main Streets um, in our small communities. So if you've been to Baker City out in Eastern Oregon, Joseph, if you've ever backpacked the Wallawas, uh, Bandon, Astoria, like you can think of all these amazing main streets. And actually you, you can think of Portland as a series of main streets. Um, and so we have actually teamed up with the Main Street Alliance and some of the local Main Street Alliance managers. Um, and of course the elected officials that represent these areas on a recurring ask, and that is we need more money for Main Street revitalization. And so that has been a really big, you know, land use lever that we have worked on um, with officials throughout the state. Another picture of just Baker City. Um, I'm not gonna go too far into more industrial. On the flip side, and we felt this here in, Port in the Portland metro area, is um, the benefits of the urban growth boundary guiding development away from hazards. So we can think about the quality of life, the connection we have, the ease of getting to and from places. But as we have more intense and more frequent natural disasters, 
we're also seeing the benefit of more connected compact development. And so this is a graph of how many homes are located in what is called the wildland urban interface. And this is an area where you have high and extreme risk of wildfire. And California, there's over 16 million total in the American West uh, that are built in the WUI. Over 5 million in my home state of California, over 3 million in Texas, which is actually the fastest growing uh, amount of housing in this area, and over 1 million in Colorado. And Oregon, even with our amazing forests, um, only has a little over 100,000 homes in the WUI. So we absolutely we have a manageable problem when it when we come to thinking about how do we protect the lives of Oregonians who are living in these high hazard areas who are literally living in the line of fire. That is a much easier number to connect with, to identify with, and ultimately to get resources to, whether it's to harden their homes, whether it's to you know switch their roof from wood and shingles to uh, to metal or to um, asphalt. Um, and so that's the, I think it's, that has been the focus is, um, really helping to focus on the hundred thousand homes here in Oregon and also prevent new ones. And that is where in land use, if you enter any land use conversation, there's always this developer realtor push to build wherever, however. And so that is where we really live a lot of times is figuring out how do we connect with decision makers, but also the, the the public that they represent to understand the value add behind something like our urban growth boundary and our exclusive forest use zoning in this example. And this is really spoken to Southern Oregon. Uh, Senator Jeff Golden and Representative Pam Marsh have been incredible champions to work with down there, but the local electeds, they really understand the nuts and bolts, they get these land use decisions. So as they rebuild from some of the 2020 and 2021 fires, they're looking inside. They don't wanna go outside. Um, developers and realtors are pushing them. They have learned how to say no to that um, and how to keep that, how to still stay in office, right? And that's an entirely, that could be a whole other session um, is just developing that skill. I don't know, Cassie, I feel like I feel like we're going to hear your transportation session, so I don't really want to go too far into that. So I'm going to let you I'm going to let you take that with Aaron. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and I want to check on time. OK, so we have like 30 minutes. So I do want to share um, community organizer by training. And there used to be an amazing conference called AMP, which was hosted by Western State Center. And I hope we're like a bunch of us who graduated from there are lobbying them to try to do more of these. And this is why I'm so excited that Nick is bringing this kind of series. But I just wanted to spend 15 minutes, although I will talk about this any day, all day about campaign strategy and communications. We can talk all day long about policy what matters is how we message and how we move the electorate. We have a base, then we have persuadables, and then we have the intractable opposition. We don't need to worry about that opposition. What we need to worry about is, are we igniting and inspiring our base? Are they really feeling pumped up about it? And are we bringing over the persuadables so that they understand how to come over here? And so I have, I just want to kind of run through three examples around the Portland for Everyone campaign that, you know, we learned um, through that. And the first I would say is build upon the things that bond us. And that is really figuring out what is the story. You hear storytelling a lot. I need more than that. And so I'm going to give you an example of um, we invite our members to name the future that they want to create, that they want to live in, that they're excited to live in. And so one of the things that we got back was, I want to live in a neighborhood that my kids can walk to school in, but that we're going to run into their teacher on their way because their teacher can afford to live in that same neighborhood. And like, that is what, that is what causes rooms. That's what I think we as organizers can really draw out is that experience. And there's an amazing strategy, campaign strategist um, who only focuses on communications. Her name's Anant Shanker Osario. So I highly recommend any of her materials. She has a free um, 
a free website, you know, a website with free resources called ASO Communications. I can share this link with Nick and make it easy for you to find. She has all these one pagers about different policy guides, different primers. Um, and she uses an example. She does a lot of testing for focus groups in order to create the campaign messaging. What's your magic language you need to be having in your testimony and commercial t or TV ads in your digital campaigns. Um, and she used the example of paid family leave. And she said, do you support paid family leave? Majority did. Do you, do you agree that a parent should be there the first time their child smiles? Way high, like way much more higher than do you support paid family leave? And so it's that translation as organizers and as strategists we all get to do that ultimately gets the persuadables to be part of the base and to really understand how do we how do we really convert people? How do we really get people to understand? Yeah, that is a terrible situation if a parent misses the first time that their kid smiles. And then all of a sudden, we say we can turn it back on the intractable opposition, X, whoever is the ex lobbyist for that category, and say, I want to live in a future where my kids can walk to school and we're going to run into their teacher because they can afford to live there. Do you not want that? Because if you say, I don't want that future, you're the asshole. And all of a sudden, all the persuadables are like, well, I didn't agree with that lobbyist at all. They're terror. I don't know. I'm not, and I'm not going to agree with what they next have to say. So that's kind of the messaging that um, we really found to be helpful for Portland for everyone, um, which was a five year long campaign over two mayors and many, many commissioners, many staff. Um, but the base was always there. The base was always there and it was always growing, which is why it could sustain a five year campaign. Um, and ultimately, it did rewrite the rules around zoning and allowed duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes and actually added a density bonus if you built capital A affordable housing. So you could build a sit, you can now build a sixplex on your corner lot in Portland if you're Habitat for Humanity, if you're Hacienda CDC, if you're building that capital A affordable housing. And the other thing that we policy wise we were able to get in was at least one of the homes needs to be um, accessible, needs to be ADA compliant. And so that was, I think, some of the zoning changes. The other big thing that I will say industry home builders are still lobbying for is city council shrank the footprint of a home that is allowed in Portland. So instead of a home that can go up to the entire setback, take up an entire parcel, go up all the way, now you have 2,500 square feet limit. That's your max. And the, you know, uh, you get, you can get, I would say it's different. It's tiered for duplex, triplex, but that was something that really changed the market. It really sent a signal to home builders to say, you need to change your current pro forma, your current blueprint for what you're building in the city. And so, you know, they changed it because you it's actually pretty easy to do to change that. And then they are able to build the 2,500 square feet. But there was a proposal, even when I was in the mayor's office, and then a future proposal about, well, what if we paid per square foot to build something bigger, was what the home builders wanted. And, you know, thank goodness for city council at the time, you know, I still think actually right now city council would say, we don't want to deal with this. Um, I'm not going to mud on that. But, um, you know, they said, no, we really want to send a signal that we need more housing. We actually have we actually have people one person households two people households we actually have smaller households now than we did in the past with bigger homes this is a mismatch and so that's really where um i think again the campaign messaging really enabled fact finding and the policy making um to do this um the other thing is when in doubt simulate it out um and that is something that we have found really helpful helpful in the urban growth boundary debate. In I'd say a decade ago, people used to say, 
the urban growth boundary is making this region unaffordable. It's that's that's the issue, and we just need to get rid of it. And so now, whenever we're confronted with that, although it's very much died down, to say, great, let's get rid of it. Let's imagine we all live in Boise. How are they doing? And we look at Boise has, in the last two years, had 45% increase in rents sustainably. People are getting priced out of Boise. There is no land use regulation in Boise, Idaho, for those, for those who don't know. And so we say, well, it doesn't look like the urban growth boundary is the make or break feature for affordability. For affordability. And then we add a bunch more cities and towns that don't have our urban growth boundary that are still grappling with affordability. Um, and so that has been, again, when in doubt, simulated out. We don't want to test it in real policymaking. We want to test it more in debates, but it's really helpful to just allow the realtors and the home builders to say, great, you know, as Richa said earlier, they don't have something that will actually benefit the quality of life or the majority of people here. So let's simulate it out. See what the forecast looks like if we went with the, what they're proposing. Um, and the last, again, is positivity over politics, um, and that has really been, um, I know we are going through a restructure <laughs> at city in our city uh, hall right now, but, you know, I would say that there are moments um, of hope and change, and so I think that is something that has been, um, I think, nourishing for the movement and gets you through the tough moments. And so this one is for the organizers and the strategists and the house party hosts in particular, because it can feel really hard when the pendulum swings back and you think it was all for naught and, um, uh, or we lose someone we really loved on council um, and we really identified with. And so that is something that I think is really important for the movement. Um, and I will say um, part of your part of getting the storytelling out and like what what that emotion what that emotional feel is is you are going to have to go through your own personal journey to figure out what your story is and that to me honestly was my hardest part was like being comfortable in my own personal journey and like what it meant to grow up with asthma and water alerts and what it meant to grow up in a farm worker family, and what it meant to grow up queer. And that is really hard to be vulnerable in a room of strangers, but I will tell you, it also invites others to be vulnerable themselves. And that's how you get their stories and them confident to go in front of that two minute timer in a very hostile setting and share their story and really get that emotional feel. So again, you got to have the support system in the movement and like, thank goodness we do. Um, but it again, that doesn't happen by accident either. So I think with that, I mean, I kind of want to cut it short because I want to hear any questions, reflections. Um, and yeah, if there are any important land use, I think land use, whether it's land conservation or land development issues that you know, Cassie and I can help with. Mary and I are actually working on opposing a warehouse distribution center in East Portland, um, uh, in a in Argay Park Rose. In uh, for those who don't know those neighborhoods, it's majority Black and Brown folks. Those schools are 100% free and reduced lunch um, students, um, and they currently walk across 122nd, which has had two fatalities in the last two years. Um, and they want to add hundreds of truck trips. They're going to add 37 truck bays um, at that location, right in the vicinity of uh, high school, uh, middle school, and two elementary schools, and a Tibetan cultural center. So it's been incredible to see the students organize and lead on this. Um, and they're all learning land use very quickly, um, which is, you know, gives, yeah, always gives me goosebumps when they start talking about economic development, comprehensive planning, and goal nine. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, you know, so I just kind of want to turn it over to you all to, to hear your questions and your reflections. Yeah. Yeah. 
that's my so that's my shorthand at saying that there will most likely be subsidy public subsidy in that housing and that no matter what happens to that housing it will be within reach of people who live within a certain um, area median income whether it's 60 percent area median income whether it's 30 percent um but um, there's right now, I would say the main narrative, the main culture war that we are in is, um, a supply and demand argument is saying, oh, well, we just need to build more housing overall and we'll be fine. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it's really like, we're really saying we need to focus on the right supply. Oregon has 140,000 unit shortfall as of earlier this year early numbers are showing that it's actually um, much less already, but uh, let's just assume it's 140,000, 90, over 90% 90 of those homes are for people who earn less than the area median income. These are our physician assistants. These are our teachers. These are our nurses. These are our assistant engineers. Um, and these are our dental hygienists. And so again, the stories that we're getting out and that we're organizing are very much like, don't you like your teeth cleaned? Like, don't you want your dental, don't you want your dental hygienist to be rested and not make a mistake on that mouth of yours? <laughs> um, and so it's, I think that's um, been, that's been our counter is we really need to be surgical about this. This isn't a crisis for everyone. If you're making above the median income, you're doing fine. Some of them have two homes. They're doing great. They're enjoying bend and bandon on the weekends sometimes. This isn't about, this, this is not a housing crisis. This is a house aff housing affordability crisis. And we have to be surgical with the very limited public resources we have to say, this is where the road, the money for our roads or lighting or sewer or water should go. And that is the, that's the fight we are in right now is really that tailored approach. But yeah, capital A, it's, it's shorthand. <laughs> it's not technical. Yeah. Yeah, well, other, so there are towns in California that have it. So Sonoma has adopted one. Uh, Marin has adopted one. A lot of North Bay towns have adopted them. Um, and so I would, so, and yeah, I would say that there's a spectrum of an urban growth boundary. There's some that are so strict that they can't expand at all. And then you could actually have a land constraint. Um, Boulder, Colorado is that example where they said, no, we're not allowing anyone else to this area. And it has gotten so expensive there that now you have working, the people who are working in that town living somewhere else and then commuting in because they won't allow affordable housing to be built in part and they won't get the land up for it. Um, on the flip side, you have something like Miami-Dade County Urban Growth Boundary, if you can call it a boundary, and it just is it expands, it's expansive. And it actually causes a lot of confusion for the development community because they're guessing where in the sandbox the city is going to be building their next thing. And so that's actually a plus is we do have a lot of developers here in Portland that have that actually have local roots like Tom Kilbane with Urban Renaissance. Um, they're doing the Lloyd Center uh, redevelopment, which is going to have over 5,000 homes, all subject to inclusionary housing. They're keeping the ice skating rink. And they're also having a plan for the affordable commercial spaces to all get first right into the new space. And they're putting parks and investment in the MAC station and the and the bus station there. Um, but they they want the certainty, right? Like that is what a developer wants in order for them to to translate that into their spreadsheet so they they can go get the capital to build what they need. And so in Miami Dade, where you have this guessing game, that's been a really big issue because you're gonna have a hodgepodge of uses that are allowed and there's no strategic plan. And so they're kind of on their own. And that's why you, um, when you visit those kinds of towns, you can kind of see like complete developments. And so they end up with like housing 
in um, with like a gym and a restaurant and a bar and a bowling alley. And they're all in like one area because the developer said, we're just going to build all of it because we don't know what y'all are doing at the city. Portland falls, Portland, I would say falls somewhere in the middle. Our, um, the current approach in our urban growth boundaries is you need to show, you need to demonstrate some reasonable need for land. So uh, based on your population growth or based on your job growth, and you have to show that you have exhausted the land you currently have, and then you can expand. So actually from 2016 to present day, there have been um, over 36 urban growth boundary expansions across the state. Not all but two have sailed through. I mean, we have actually supported uh, some urban growth boundary expansions because we feel it's important to say, yeah, we're going to grow. You know, these areas are going to grow. You get, And we're, we need to figure out what that looks like, but you got to grow. Um, there's also an opportunity in an Oregon law for an urban growth boundary swap. And that is a, that's kind of a spot land use decision where maybe an area of the original urban growth boundary is not popping off and there's no investment going there. And you actually thought a bunch was, and now you're, now you're wrong. That's okay. Like we make our best guess, right. And the market didn't come. And the example in the Portland Metro region is Clackamas County, right? A lot of farmland out in Clackamas County, not that much private investment. And I'm talking like Estacada area um, and it's beautiful rolling hills, but there isn't going to be, you know, a big fab plant or housing even there. And Clackamas County doesn't have the resources to pay for the road, the water, the sewer, the lighting, the utility grid. So it's not coming. So meanwhile, in Washington County side, they are growing. And so Tigerd showed that they had exhausted all the land inside their urban growth boundary. They had done all the missing middle housing. They had done all these affordable housing uh, investments and they still were, they still demonstrated need. And so they requested 500 acres for a planned residential area. They committed to missing middle housing, transit connectivity, um, wetland restoration, um, because it does border the Tualatin watershed um, and um, affordability components. And so all those conditions are on that urban growth boundary swap approval. And so 500 acres of our metro area um, came in to the boundary um, in, in Tigard, and then 500 acres came out of Clackamas County. And of course, Clackamas County is like, you took the land away from us, how dare you? You know, and Chair Judy Smith, who would, I don't, I mean, I know this is recorded, but I don't really care, but because she is just so blatant, she tweets about, you know, how bad our land use system is. And I think she also tweeted, um, she also tweeted when we had the COVID restrictions, she's like, I'm not obeying those. I'm having everybody over to my Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and so anyway, so, you know, it may, Metro balances those political, um, those political considerations. But when you have a really great proposal and you have sensible data backing it up, then your urban growth boundary can give. I will mention, I need to mention, what the gambling strip effect is on the boundary. So land out, let me start land outside the boundary. We're gonna zoom into Washington County as the example. If you're, there's a lot of farming happening out in Washington County and it's some of the world's best soils. Um, and if you're a farmer and you own an, the acreage, your acre, one acre is about $10,000 um, and you get a property tax exemption uh, because you are farming. And that's kind of the deal. That's kind of the, the trade here um, between the state and the property owner. If that land were to come into the urban growth boundary and be zoned commercial or industrial, all of a sudden that same acre, because it's inside the boundary, it's now worth $700,000. So you have a lot of land speculators buying up land near the urban growth boundary, whether or not they want to farm or not, they lease it out and it looks like farming, but they still own that land. They will lobby, and I don't blame them to be honest, like, right, this is a reasonable human being. You're telling me the difference between a 10,000 acre and a $700,000 acre 
price point is an urban growth boundary, which is not real, right? <laughs> There's no like fence around it. You're telling me if I just get it in, I make millions? Well, of course, a reasonable person is going to probably make a life living off of doing that. And so there is a gambling strip effect all along our urban growth boundaries um, where they're hot, right? They got it. This the market inside still has to be um, desirable. It doesn't really work if you're in. Um, I'm not going to name a name because that's me into the town. But if it's a town that is economically depressed, it's not really going to work. But if you're in Bend, that is absolutely going to work, assuming you don't have lava a uh, lava bed. But um, so that is one of the effects, one of the one of the kind of interests that we constantly battle around our urban growth boundary. And it's insidious, right? Because you, 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 you got to call that out with decision makers, but you also don't want to make it a driving part of the conversation. Um, because it's really, it's really gets really personal, gets really heated, gets really sour. And ultimately, the elected kind of just backs, tries to back away from a situation. Um, so, but I do want to, I do want to make sure people understand that effect. Yeah. So you talked a lot at the beginning about like bridging the gap between um, like agricultural folks and like urban. And I'm curious if you, like I think a lot about that, especially how like industry has done a really good job of hitting like environs against like union folks or like even agricultural folks and how we bridge those gaps. And so I was wondering if you could talk about like whether it's strategy or rhetoric um, that has worked in those conversations, and like what hasn't worked and like what are things that you explicitly don't even want to employ because you've seen it not work other places? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, I think it's figuring out, I, I think it's figuring out some sort of shared kind of manifesto almost, right? To me, and our organization, we view having 97% of farmers who have local roots as, a, as an asset. They're more likely to be responsible stewards of our land. And I would put that into, yes, we can, we can talk about, oh my God, there's effluent going off this farm, but at least it's a phone call to someone you know. It's not a multinational corporation, you know, like a prologious kind of style effect of a business that doesn't really care. You're like, you know, talk to our lawyers. Um, and so that is something that I think we, we have to protect from our perspective. And I think if environmental groups were to view that as a shared goal of we really need to make sure that our stewards are supported and that's how we start the conversation with them. I think like, it's more like, I want you here. I want you to succeed. And I don't want this, like part of that is how do we get you to stop this effluent, right? How, or how do we get you to stop this CAFO? Um, and so that's the sort of, I think, approach that we've seen be more successful. And I think that was the shift. That was the shift about climate mitigation, um, comment, which felt hard for the agricultural community. They felt like, wow, like we're, we're being hit hard by the weather and by the global supply chain and the price and the global market prices, right? If turkey hazelnuts do very well, our hazelnut farmers here in Oregon do poorly because the price, all of a sudden everyone's having a great crop year and then the price goes down. Um, and so that's, they constantly feel that um, pressure and a lot of them are in debt because they've taken it out for the equipment or for their seeds um, or for their workers. And so they're, I mean, they're, yeah, they're living in that. So I think like part of it is what does a trauma-informed care approach look like to working with agricultural groups? And a lot of it at baseline has to do with being like, I, I value your stewardship. I know it's really hard. And let's think of some options for what feels good because you want that person to feel in charge you want that person to still feel like they have agency over their own life and what to do about their operation but environmental groups i understandably also want to want to be like what are you putting in the water what's going on over here um and so i think that's there's an opportunity there i think for bridge building yeah 
Is there any in the chat? I haven't been watching. This is a comment from uh, talking about the uh, tiger development in particular. Yeah. He's making comments that there should be a displacement criteria uh, because there's too many centers that are being displaced presently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to look. We'll have to look into it. I think it's harder. It's yeah, it's hard for a new swap because the city will say, well, there's no one being displaced because no one lives here right now. But I still think that that could be a criteria for any urban growth boundary expansion. And that's something we can definitely take to Metro Council, who's currently updating the um, urban growth boundary report right now. And they ask us, they say, what conditions should we put? Because that is a very big carrot that Metro has is expanding that urban growth boundary. And so that's a it's a very big opportunity to place affordability requirements or sustainability requirements um, into that. So yeah, appreciate the comment. And we can definitely figure out how to elevate that in an urban growth boundary process. Can you talk briefly about like say somebody from the class became like really interested in like wanting to be involved in each of the process of metro? How would you yeah? Everyone is, right? Everyone's really interested in that. <laughs> like one person. <laughs> um, yeah. So every six years, Portland Metro updates its urban growth boundary um, type of decision. And your Metro Council is one of the only regional directly elected uh, bodies in the nation. And uh, one of the main things is, of course, this urban growth boundary. Although I feel like now they're poster, they're more of like a poster for the Oregon Zoo, parks and nature, affordable housing, homeless services. So, and I will say your Metro Council is very friendly to, um, you know, to, I think, the Green New Deal policies and figuring out what that looks like. Um, so, uh, you know, I definitely say of all the jurisdictions that we have, that we experience same language, same vision. You know, I think Metro Council really understands um, because they have to live in the future. They have to do forward-looking planning. So they're doing a lot of these reflections, which is simulating out what that kind of thing looks like. Um, so, um, so yeah, getting engaged in the urban growth boundary process. Um, each city has to petition Metro to expand their own urban growth boundary. So if no cities petition to expand and everyone's like, we're good, we got enough land and a process, we're good, we're done, right? Like there's, I mean, there's, we got other stuff to work on. Um, but if one city petitions, then it starts up this round table, this advisory committee, um, and then this data driven um, kind of process um, with a lot more engagement. And so the city of Sherwood currently is petitioning Metro for an urban growth boundary expansion um, and saying they need land mostly for housing, although there is some industrial land in their proposal. And uh, Metro Council is currently considering it. It's their Sherwood is having to pitch their concept for what expansion looks like and how it meets their goals. And so there's a lot of opportunity as a resident, as, you know, a, uh, someone who may work at an organization who cares about this um, to uh, kind of read up on Sherwood's proposal and then figure out, okay, you're saying that you have this housing need. How is your proposed concept for how to build in this, how to build in this land meeting that need? And so that's really where there's a lot of reasonable debate, really good debate, um, but that's where to definitely get involved. And I will say, I should have said this um, from the get-go, um, the land use, land use decisions require people to raise their concerns at the earliest level. So if, say you're watching a land use decision in your neighborhood or, you know, in part of your work plan, and you're seeing a lot of questions, you're having a lot of questions and you're having a lot of concerns about it, and the decisions adopted and then you say okay now i need like i now i want to engage unfortunately the land use board of appeals is probably going to say you missed the window 
because you needed to raise your questions and concerns on the record of that land use decision, whether it's an urban growth boundary decision, whether it's a development application, whether it's even a conservation easement, whatever the land use decision is, you needed to raise it right then. Um, and the, really the intent of that is, can you, you need to figure, you need to work things out at the lowest practical level, right? So I think it's good intent, right? The government can't read your mind. They need to have notice. Um, and so you have to engage at that earliest level. Um, I think where it can bite people, um, where we get frustrated is there's so many land use decisions happening. How is anyone going to track these things and know in a 300 page document if something is good or bad? So that's where we, that's where we come in. So we have a land use hotline um, and we have a reported land use issue. So if you ever, you know, this is, this is why we exist is to help people sort through, is there a land use issue? What exactly is the concept? Is this development consistent with the comprehensive plan? Is your urban growth boundary expansion completely out of whack? Um, that's why we exist. That's why donors, you know, support us, why we have uh, foundation funding is to help everyone um, really understand and sort through the puzzle that can be a land use decision. So please reach out. We're always, you know, we're always available and we have a team of, of attorneys and planners and advocates to help out. Yeah, and I would also say you can sign up on some city websites, like the Bureau of Development Services and the Bureau of Planning Sustainability have like lists that you can get on that will just like email you notices. So if you really want to become a land use nerd and like start commenting on every decision, like that's your right as somebody who lives in the city. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. I'll let. Hmm. Oh, cool. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, okay, we're going to turn this off in a sec. Uh, next week, we're fully online. And um, then the we're doing policy again. And I it just occurred to me that maybe we'll do a, bit, a little bit about like public records requests too, just because that's always like on my mind. And it's a skill that maybe other people want to learn about. It's really fun. Um, so next week we'll do some more like specific policy stuff that's going on in, in our area and uh, some idea generation and we'll do some public records. So yeah, track on the discord. I'll send out the video online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks everybody for participating. I hope the sound was a lot better today. We tried harder. Um, and, but if there's stuff that's still messed up, let me know and we'll fix it for next time. Alrighty. Thanks everyone. Bye.